Sir Kenley, okay? We're here to arrest you for conspiring to import into Australia a commercial quantity of border control precursors. Do you understand that? I'd be kidding with you. I'm not, mate. I'm deadly serious. It's a jail? No, it's not. You're yeah. now under arrest. Meet Mark Standen. He gave it all away for... For money, for greed. Australia's most corrupt cop. Well, he's probably number one. Standen was the inside man, the key to a $60 million drug importation from the international cartel. The whole process was utterly corrupt. Investigative reporter Adam Shand asks the big questions. What made Mark Standen turn to the dark side? and discovers a disturbing picture of a man trapped by his own desires. He's in the game. And in the end, there are no rules of the game. When the news broke in 2008 that Mark Standen had been arrested in the car park of the New South Wales Crime Commission, it was like a tidal wave breaking over Australian law enforcement. How could one of the country's most senior cops and untouchable have gone to the dark side? This story embodies all the fears about fighting organised crime today, that in going after the big crooks, you risk becoming one yourself. Our story starts in London with a crime reporter who stumbled onto the story quite by accident. I was doing an unrelated investigation into Italian mafia and their links with Dutch underworld and Dutch criminals ostensibly trafficking uh, drugs to Australia by the tonne. At what point did you realise there was a connection to Mark Standard? when the Australian Federal Police came to our office and tried to shut down our investigation. The editor rang me up and said, what the hell, tell me why, I've got a foyer full of police officers in uniform, what have you done? And I'm like, whoa, hang on, what have I done? I haven't done anything. And we worked out very quickly in the five minutes it took them to be escorted up onto level three that it was related to this investigation that I had been running for several months at that point. The media raid was led by a team of Australian Federal Police officers, alarmed that Charles Miranda's investigation would tip off a key player in a massive drug smuggling operation to import 300 kilograms of pseudoephedrine used in the manufacture of the drug ICE, with an ultimate street value of $60 million. And the way that they described it at the time was it was the largest and most sensitive police investigation in Australian law enforcement history. The key target of the AFP's investigation was Mark Standen, the Assistant Director of Investigations at the New South Wales Crime Commission. You must have been flawed. I was flawed. Um, and I knew some of the guys who were being brought into what they kept on referring to as brought in on the joke. And that was one of the phrases that the AFP created. Are you in on the joke? Yes, I'm in on the joke, the joke being that one of the top law enforcers in the country was involved in this case. It was like, OK, well, let's look at, let's look at what he's done, what he is going to do, and what, how we can work together to, to suit both our ends. You cut a deal with the AFP. What was that? Simply that we would not write any more stories, but at some point we wanted to be given a heads up when they were coming towards an arrest. In exchange for waiting, Miranda was given the inside running on the investigation. So I'd mix with the police, uh, the undercover guys. that Spent a lot of time with the, uh, with the Dutch police. You have to imagine this was a huge operation for the Dutch as well. The main Dutch cartel were the largest synthetic drug traffickers in the world. They were making money almost on par with someone like Pablo Escobar in the, in the cocaine world, they were doing that with synthetic drugs. Because of the global appetite for, uh, for their drugs, their operation was so extensive. They were 
making these pills in the back of semi-trailers while the semi-trailers were rolling around the, uh, the, the canals of, uh, of the Netherlands. I don't think they ever considered Mark Standen as one of the principals as such of this cartel. They probably regarded him more as an asset. And what an asset to have if you've got a law enforcer who's the eyes and ears in the law enforcement world in Australia. Of course, Standen wasn't the only Australian asset. He was in league with Bill Gelatoli, a Sydney food importer with a legitimate business and a warehouse in Western Sydney. The perfect front for a drug importation on this scale. On the Dutch side, the kingpin was a bloke called Lewick Weirden. He was organising a shipment of rice to come from Pakistan to Sydney. It was a dummy run. The cartel figured if they could get the rice on its own through Port Botany without a hiccup, the next shipment would be the real deal. The pseudoephedrine would simply be scattered through dozens of five kilogram rice bags. Looking back, this seems like it was always doomed to failure. But what you've got to remember is the crooks thought they were working under the protection of one of the most powerful cops in the country. The crooks didn't realise the AFP were already onto them, secretly recording conversations between Viridin and Jalalati, who went by the code name Rashid. Hello. Hello, Rashid. Uh, we are going to range now. I spoke with my friend. We are going to range now. Uh, two shipments mm -hmm. complete uh, with all the documents. Yep. And uh, so I think within uh, 40 days uh, we have it on the move. Fantastic. Okay, let's take stock of who we have so far. There's the Dutch connection, Luke Verden, who's organising the shipment. Then we have the local importer, Bill Gelatley, who's going to receive the shipment in Sydney. Then we have the insider at the Crime Commission, Mark Standen. But there's one person who ties all these villains together. It's James Kinch. He's an Irish crook who was the mastermind of the entire operation. And how he turns Mark Stannon to the dark side is a fascinating story. Well, James Kinch was an Irishman. He built up a substantial criminal record for property and other crimes in the UK. He then moved to the Netherlands, started work for the syndicate, and after a couple of years, he came to Australia as the syndicate's representative for Australia. And it was not long after that that he got pinched here and uh, Standard became involved with him from that on. He was arrested and Mark Standen was part of that arrest in which they questioned him uh, extensively and, and, and ended up charging him. And he rolled over and said, no, I'll, I'll, I'll work for you guys. And so Kinch accepted Standen's offer and became a registered informant for the Crime Commission. All charges against Kinch for money laundering and drug trafficking were dropped. In return, Kinch coughed up $900,000 of his illicit profits, a contribution to the Crime Commission's coffers. Remarkably, $300,000 was released back to Kinch, money that was supposed to be monitored in a controlled operation to see how the syndicate washed its cash. But guess what? The 300 grand disappeared down the plug hole, never to be seen again. And in 2004, Kinch, the informer, left Australia a free man. For Standen and Kinch, it was the start of a beautiful friendship. He actually got Mark to, uh, to change sides, as it were. Soon after Kinch left Australia, he started paying Standen via Bill Gelatoli. During his time of dealings with uh, James Kinch, it appears that he obtained about somewhere between $300,000 and $500,000 cash from James Kinch. Good morning, how are you? Can you do a um, uh, electronic transfer for me? I'll okay. Get the detail. Yep. And the name, name of the person is Mark, M-A-R-K. Yep. And the surname is S-T-A-N-D-E-N. S-T-A-N? D-E-N. 
D E. Yep. And have a look at it again. It's on here. Uh, 5,000 feet. Yep. Yep. Can you let me know when you've done that? No problem. Psychologist Dr Stephen Barron used to be an internal investigator for the New South Wales Police. He knows how cops go bad. Kinch owned him. From the second that, that he takes money from Kinch, Kinch owns him. And it's very hard to have any integrity if you, if you don't own what you have between your legs. It belongs to somebody else. Next, the warning signs, how Mark Standen turned bad. He had a real reputation for gambling massive amounts of money that just couldn't be funded out of police salaries. So in 2008, 300 kilos of precursor chemical pseudoephedrine was on its way to Sydney courtesy of a network of contacts that Mark Stanton built up as an untouchable in the Crime Commission. But let's take our story a bit further back. What made Mark Stanton turn to the dark side? A bad cops born or made? Mark Stanton had a fairly ordinary middle-class upbringing in Sydney's inner west. He went to school at St. Patrick's, Strathfield. It's been reported that he was keen to join the RAAF, but instead he joined Australian Customs in 1975, straight out of school. How would you describe his personality? Um, well, I always found him a very personable person. When I looked at his uh, background, and I did speak to a lot of people over a number of years, what you saw was a very eager young person who wanted to make a hit, and by that I mean uh, wanted to catch crooks, wanted to seize drugs, wanted to make a name for himself, was very enthusiastic about being there, but also wanted to do it in a rather flamboyant way. Standen's first big career move was to the Federal Narcotics Bureau, then an arm of customs, where his unusual policing methods first came to the attention of authorities. Standen and a number of other police from the Narcotics Bureau had raided one or more homes in the eastern suburbs, and in one of the homes they'd found a relatively small quantity of hash. In a, a few number, foils. In a few foils. The foils were taken back to the office at the old customs house in Sydney, where they sat in a drawer for some weeks. It was only a small quantity of drugs, not enough to lay charges. The New South Wales police were apparently uninterested in taking on the case, which meant more paperwork for Standen and a second narcotics agent. They had to put in a report of seeking approval to destroy it, explain why they had to do it and all of that. Uh, to save that work, they decided to flush it down the toilet. However, in doing that, it meant that they had to falsify a number of other records. They recorded on the official search of the house that no drugs were found. But this did end up in front of the Stuart Royal Commission? It, it did end up in front of the Stuart Royal Commission and it was all publicly recorded. But yeah. it wasn't enough to stop Mark Standen in his tracks? No, no. It Why? didn't appear... Well, I think it was seen to be a, um, an indiscretion, but not an act of corruption. Despite the concern, Standen kept landing on his feet. His next stop was the Australian Federal Police College in Canberra. He talked a good talk, and he would become this larger-than-life character going back to the days that he, he joined the AFP and uh, down there in Barton in Canberra at the, uh, the police college, he was a guy everyone wanted to hang out with. As part of the training, they, they all got an allowance to, uh, to spend. He would blow his in the first day. And he'd go, boys, I've got no more money left. Here we are, we're in college, I've got no money. And everyone's like, ah, don't worry, Mark, we'll sort you out. And they just gave him more money. 
Oh, I'll pay you back later. Yeah, no worries, mate. Good as gold. Pay us back later. Whether anyone ever got paid back, a lot of his friends said, no, he never paid me any money back. But we didn't care. He was that sort of character. Every bad cop has his Achilles heel. It can be booze, drugs or sex. For Standen, it was gambling. Alarm bell should have been rung earlier, you know. He had a real reputation for gambling massive amounts of money that just couldn't be funded out of police uh, salaries. There was always a pub nearby, and he would just have a punt, have a punt on the horses, have a punt for the uh, poker machines. Now, the extent to which he gambled was never really borne out, though you'd have to imagine he gambled fairly heavily. Mark Standen was chased for his gambling debts while he worked for the AFP, and he cashed in his super to pay them off. The debt situation must have been chronic. There are strict rules about early access to super unless you can prove exceptional circumstances. Despite this, Standen was given voluntary redundancy from the AFP and left in 1995 with a clean record. In 1996, Standen took a senior role at the New South Wales Crime Commission, a secretive organisation that has the most far-reaching powers of any law enforcement body in New South Wales. It was here that Mark Standen learned to wield power and to work the system to his advantage. Using the powers of the Commission, he was looking to organise crime, but he was also able to launch investigations into senior police who he believed might have been corrupt. Mark Standen basically led a team which broke a whole lot of rules, but was really there to simply even up personal scores not to actually investigate serious corruption. I was a target of that team for probably two or three years. The whole process was utterly corrupt. At the time of the probe, led by Standen, Nick Caldas was head of homicide. But previous to that, he wore another hat as a New South Wales Police Union representative. It was in that role he believes he made political enemies. What were the allegations against you? I've never been told exactly what it was. I am now aware that my own phone was bugged for quite some time. I know that my office was also bugged. My ex-wife and children also had their phone bugged. What did they find after all those warrants and all that investigation? What did they find? Nothing. What effect did that have on you, not only as a police officer, but as a person? I felt betrayed by the fact that people could do this sort of thing and get away with it simply because they happened to be working under the umbrella of the Crime Commission. What they were doing under Mark Standen was entirely inappropriate and mostly illegal. Coming up, the Crime Commission goes into business with a drug dealer. They made a profit though, didn't they? Oh, it made, it made a very substantial profit. I'm investigating the life and times of Mark Standen, whose fall from grace shocked the law enforcement community. We've heard about the relationship between cops and their informants, but you have to ask, what's the cost of that information? What happens when the police cross the line and begin to profit from the very crimes they're trying to solve? Operation Mocker, tell us all about that. What happened? Well, a criminal had run the Crime Commission had asked to speak to Mark Standen as he thought he could help him with a number of drug investigations. This man became known as Tom and became an informant. Tom had seven kilos of cocaine, which he subsequently produced to the Crime Commission. That seven kilos had been imported into Australia uh, via corruption at the airport and Tom had apparently already sold three kilos of the drug when he took it to Stanton. The arrangement was that he would be selling that cocaine to give the Crime Commission increased access into the drug networks. So now, the Crime Commission and Tom are in business together. When Tom took the cocaine back, he sold it to his underworld contacts and the proceeds came back to the Crime Commission. 
They made a profit, though, didn't they? Oh, it made, it made a very substantial profit. It made a very substantial profit and uh, overlapped with a number of networks. I believe it was $936,000, the profit that was made in that little operation. Uh, yes, it was something like that. And subsequently, 13 people were arrested. It's true that Operation Mocker did result in some high-level arrests. But of the seven kilos of cocaine that went out, only one kilo ever came back. Later in court, Mark Standen was challenged about this and whether the Crime Commission had in fact endangered lives by brokering the sale of cocaine. In response, he said there are no recorded deaths from cocaine use, which is a topic we researched. Seems a pretty weak rationale to me. Standen was mentored for 12 years at the New South Wales Crime Commission by its director, Philip Bradley, who expressed his shock when his star pupil was ultimately brought down by the drug's importation in 2008. Uh, well, Mr Standen has um, a long career in law enforcement and uh, a successful career. He's a very capable investigator and he's uh, risen on the back of his performance. Why did Mark Stannon get so far? Mark Stannon was in, in a, an organisation which had very little oversight, poor administration, no structures, no risk assessments. People came to Bradley and said, we have some concerns. Mr Bradley said, well, I have belief in him. And Stannon delivered for Mr Bradley. But what he didn't deliver was ethical, honest, investigative work. How does someone live coherently when they're, all they're doing is lying and cheating everybody around them? It's the game. He's in the game. Now, if you're in the game, you play by the rules of the game. And in the end, there are no rules of the game. You backstab your own colleagues, you backstab peers, you bury investigations, you betray search warrants to the people who are going to be uh, targets of the search warrants. It's the game. Trust meant nothing to Standen. Trust was access. If Bradley trusted him, that was Bradley's problem. It wasn't Standen's problem. It's the game. Wait, search warrant! Wait for the door! When you look at the seizures on national TV, there's an awful lot of pressure on these organisations to produce these monthly, weekly, daily busts. He was working with people who didn't mind bending the rules as long as you got a conviction out of it, and those convictions promoted you. Now, in the end, no one asked questions. If you got a confession, who's going to ask questions? When we return, the drugs arrive in Sydney. But all is not as it seems. Have a guess what's inside. No, I don't know. A ransom letter. What? I'm investigating the case of Mark Standen, Australia's most corrupt cop. In 2008, before he was arrested for his part in a conspiracy to import 300 kilos of pseudoephedrine, he took a call that would highlight another questionable relationship in his life. The call came from a detective who was making inquiries into a cold case from 30 years before. Eighteen-year-old Trudy Adams was picked up late one night in 1978, hitchhiking home from a dance at the Newport Surf Club. She was never seen again. All the evidence pointed to one man, a notorious sex offender and violent career criminal, Neville Tween. Trudy Adams was last seen getting into a light-coloured panel van. Tween owned a car that fitted that description. Tween and his gang were known to pick up hitchhikers uh, on the North Shore, taking them back to a property that's believed in Terry Hills and gang raping them there. 14 rapes in total, 14 gang rapes in total.
The incredible thing about the investigation into the 14 gang rapes and the presumed murder of Trudy Adams was that the police never interviewed Neville Tween and his gang, even though they were the red-hot suspects. These are very, very dangerous men. And they were protected all the way down the line. Tween was protected for the best part of 25 years by Standen. Despite the relationship, Tween was arrested and convicted in 2006 for conspiring to import 27 kilos of cocaine. There was another twist to come. Journalist and author Peter Hoisted recently spoke to the detective who in 2008 was working on the unsolved Trudy Adams case. The investigating officer became aware of an association between Tween and Standen and made an approach to Standen. He wanted the assistance of the New South Wales Crime Commission to use their coercive powers to bring a witness in and try and get some evidence out of him. Standen became very evasive and the Homicide Squad detective became a little bit suspicious and put a flag on the fire. And within a couple of days of putting the flag on, bing, 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 learns that Standen visits Tween in Long Bay Jail. One on one, no other people there. So this homicide squad detective is basically in fear of his life. Standen was in fact involved in the investigation that led to Tween's arrest. Now, around that period, Neville Tween's second wife was heard to say, why is he doing that when you look at all the money we've given him over the years? It's pretty revealing, isn't it? It is pretty revealing. It appeared that it was all about the money for Standen. It can't be proved that he was being paid by Tween, but it is clear that in 2008, Standen was actively seeking money from his other shady friends. Let's recap them. There's Jimmy Kinch, the Irish mastermind driving the operation. Louis Weirden, the Dutch drugs boss, supplying the pseudoephedrine. Bill Gelatoli, the Sydney food importer, ready to receive the drugs in a shipment of rice. And Mark Standen, who's hungry for cash. You can see from his communications uh, in his emails that he was sending to this cartel, he was becoming more and more desperate. Initially, they were just, oh, this will tide me over. This will be a sweetener for some other corrupt elements within law enforcement. Yeah, I need to pay this guy, I need to pay this guy. And as the emails went on, you could actually read into them the desperation that he was starting to feel, and he would ask for more money. And they were like, hang on a minute, we just gave you $50,000, yeah, I need more money. Here's a typical payoff scenario. Gelality was the money man, but only because Kinch had given him a million dollars up front to finance the Sydney end of the operation, including renting a warehouse. From time to time, Kinch would write emails to Gelality with coded instructions to make payments to Standen. In this case, $30,000. The email reads, can you give our friend a Christmas card and put $30 in it so that she can have a decent Christmas? Soon after, Jalality gets on the phone to Standen. Hey, mate. Hey, CEO. Next week, I need to give you a uh, Christmas ham from BB2. A nice Christmas ham, uh, you know, our famous Christmas hams. The best in the planet. A few days later, Standen meets Jalately, and the cash is exchanged. Put your hands there and your, and, and your presents on. So just be careful. Box. There. Box. Put, put a ham in it. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well. Two Christmas presents. I'll see you for me and a good one for my friend. Good one for my friend. He was a man who wanted a more glamorous, wealthier life than he had. Now, at the Crime Commission, he must have been on 200, 250 grand a year, but he had a very expensive gambling habit, and he also had, Adam, a very expensive girlfriend. 
he was a glamour boy. He would uh, shower her with, uh, with trips away. They would stay at the best hotels, they would stay in the best suites. He would buy her Tiffany bracelets or earrings or pearls or what have you. I mean, he was starting to live this sort of lavish life and he needed to sustain that. After more than two years of planning, the Sinotrans Shanghai finally lumbered into Port Botany, all the way from Pakistan. This was the second shipment organised by the cartel. The first shipment was a dummy run, rice only. But this time, it was the real deal. 300 kilograms of pseudoephedrine mixed in with rice. Enough to make drugs with a street value of $60 million. For everyone involved in the operation, it was a critical moment. It was very unnerving for them because when the rice arrived, there was no paperwork, there was no bill of lading. The Pakistanis then sent a message to Jalatali, who freaked out, saying, oh my God, they're holding us to ransom. They want more money for the paperwork. Jalatali got straight on the phone to Lewick Weirden, the Dutch connection. Hello. Hi, with me. Hello, my brother. Let, let me just tell you what happened. I received the, um, the documents today. Yeah. It, was, it was in an express post from us. Have a guess what's inside. No, I don't know. A ransom letter. What? The drug cartel's long-awaited second shipment of rice arrived in Sydney, but without any paperwork. After some frantic phone calls and emails, the documentation was sorted and the rice drug drugs cleared customs. But not before the AFP had a look at what was inside. And what did they find? A classic double cross. What was interesting was that the Pakistanis had had the last laugh. There were no drugs in them at all. So, a little bit of a problem for the police. Where's the evidence? But no, no, they go for conspiracy to import. That's the charge that, you know, they could, they could show. What you're seeing now is the moment the shipment was delivered to Jalatli's warehouse in Western Sydney. The AFP was recording everything, and remarkably, Bill Jalatli was blissfully unaware of the double cross by the Pakistanis. In a series of coded emails, Kinch told Jadlatli to let the rice sit unopened for a while. But Standen was anxious. The next day, he arrived at the warehouse to remonstrate with Jadlatli. Little did he know, the AFP net was about to close. The arrests were all coordinated. There was more than a dozen arrests made simultaneously overseas. At what point did you know that Mark Standen was going to be arrested? Well, there was a couple of times um, that we were told, brace, brace for impact, he's about to be arrested. The feds picked the one place where Standen would least expect them, the car park of the New South Wales Crime Commission headquarters in Kent Street. Mark I want you to listen to me very carefully, OK? We're here to arrest you for conspiring to import into Australia a commercial quantity of border control precursors. Do you understand that? I begin with you. I'm not, mate. I'm deadly serious. It's GM? No, it's not. We're going to conduct a search of you, OK? And then we'll be taking you back to our office, to an interview room, where we'll be giving you the opportunity to take part in a tape-recorded record of interview. Paul's going to put this on you. Really? Yes. His reaction to being arrested is, you're kidding me. You're kidding me. He had no idea it was coming. The arrogance of the man, 
the, the, the belief in his own infallibility, the belief in the stupidity organization he worked for, he didn't see it coming. He was genuinely surprised. And it's quite funny. By the time they got Mark Standen in the police car to be charged, and they brought him through the police headquarters, his story was put up on every screen on the internet. And of course, that was for effect. They put it up there and they went, hey, Mark, that's you up there, isn't it? Isn't that you? And of course, we had his photo, we had all sorts of undercover images, and we had the full story about what he had been doing for the last couple of years. And that shocked him, and that was used to put a bit of pressure on him to, uh, to, uh, to break ranks, to actually admit what he did. And of course, he never did do that. It's alleged that um, you conspired with Bill Gelatley and other persons to import into Australia border control precursors. Do you understand the allegation? Yes. What can you tell me about that allegation? Uh, well, nothing specific in relation to any conspiracy to import anything, because that's not true. Even as the allegations were outlined to him, Standen continued to protest his innocence. He even attempted to get released from custody. I'll just don't arrest me, I'll go home and come back tomorrow. What do you like? There was one admission he was prepared to make. How would you describe your current financial position? Personal? Um, poor. At the time of his arrest in 2008, Stan owed approximately a million dollars. And $150,000 on his credit cards he, alone? He owned, owed about $150,000 on three credit cards he had. You wonder where the money went. Still to come. The trial, the verdict, and the secret Standen is still keeping. I personally suspect that Mark Standen could drop a whole lot of buckets on a whole lot of people. Standen was arrested in June 2008, but his case was not heard in the New South Wales Supreme Court until March 2011. The trial, expected to run for 14 weeks, ended up dragging on for nearly five months. He basically said that Kinch and Gelatly had conned him, had tricked him, that he was just an innocent guy who was looking at doing a bit of oil importing. He was so confident of his acquittal that he knocked back a deal where he would have served eight years. A former top crime fighter has been jailed for at least 16 years over a plot to import illegal drugs into Australia. The judge said Mark Standen was motivated by money and his crime was worse because he abused his position as second in command at the New South Wales Crime Commission. Mark Standen maintained his innocence throughout his trial and does to this day, despite the overwhelming evidence linking him to the cartel and the pseudoephedrine importation. He was sent here to Long Bay Jail, where he'll remain in protective custody until 2024, when he's eligible for parole at the age of 67. In the annals of corrupt coppers, how significant is Mark Standen? Well, he's probably number one. He, he really is the biggest crooked cop we've had. And I wonder how he copes in prison. But the criminals won't like him because some of them he will have been responsible for hunting down when he was in the AFP or the Crime Commission. The cops won't like him. My God, you wouldn't want to be out there in the exercise yard. He's yet to share what he knows. Do you think it's likely he will? Mark Stannon has never admitted guilt in any way, shape or form. And in fact, since he's been in jail, he's got himself a law degree and he's made various pitches to try and have his case thrown out. He's even tried to go to the High Court to have his case reviewed, saying it's too circumstantial, I'm too senior, I'm too good, you can't beat me. And that's part of his arrogance as well that he's had throughout most of his career. I personally suspect that Mark Standen could drop a whole lot of buckets on a whole lot of people, particularly those that worked with him in the Special Crime and Internal Affairs Command. 
I'm sure he knows a lot more about other organised crime figures he's done badness with over the years. He's not saying or doing anything that gives up anybody else. His silence has probably been bought. I think the people of Australia um, are at an explanation about why he has not coughed up, if you like, everything that he knew. The day after his arrest, Standen's boss, the New South Wales Crime Commissioner, Philip Bradley, faced questions about a possible royal commission. His response? Oh, well, this is an isolated incidence of one person engaging in crime. I don't think that justifies the royal commission. What happened with Mark Standen is a failure on many levels, and it's an indictment of our system, unfortunately. The fact that he got away with it for as long as he has um, really highlighted the fact that super judicial bodies have no effective oversight. They have extraordinary powers. They have secrecy provisions. Nobody watches how they spend their money. Nobody sits in judgment on their results. They can literally do what they want without any effective oversight. Bearing all this in mind, I still see a need for bodies like the New South Wales Crime Commission, but they have to be accountable. In my opinion, the war on drugs was lost a long time ago. But if we must continue the struggle, then we have to give our cops a fighting chance of success. Some of these organised crime syndicates are some of the biggest and most powerful in the world. Um, they're essentially unstoppable. The most prominent organised crime syndicate in Australia and around the world is Undrangheta, the Calabrian Mafia. They have a turnover estimated somewhere between 60 and $80 billion a year. That makes them bigger than BHP Billet. They're involved in legitimate businesses, and it's all about flushing money, ultimately. They want to be able to have their money, bury it, bring it up, and then flush it clean. Organised crime groups don't just operate in a vacuum, they, oper they operate in collaboration with one another. As for Mark Standen, his story is a cautionary tale. It's almost like a, uh, one of those great Hollywood movies where you love and hate the character. You know, he is the fallen hero, um, and, and that was very much Mark Standen. He, he seemingly had it all and yet he still went to the dark side. He wanted more for whatever reason. He had a great career, a family, a reputation, and yet he gave it all away for, for money, for greed. Is it possible that there are other Mark Standens still operating that we don't know about? I wouldn't say it's probable, but it is likely.